Hello, at last. <clears throat> Sorry for the delay. Uh, YouTube, having a moment. But it's been one of those days. Hopefully, you can all hear me now. You will all be able to see it. And everything will go swimmingly from now. That's the plan, anyway. That's the plan. So say hello to me in the chat. And without further ado, we'll get on. So first thing that I will need to do is make it so you can see my desktop. You should be seeing a blue desktop and then my slides. That's the plan. Yes, I am now getting feedback. It's 20 seconds behind, but yes, I am live. Excellent. Thank you for that, guys. That is brilliant. Oh, it has been a terrible, terrible tech day. And normally that means at the point of broadcast, everything is fine. Tonight, no. So I am actually running on the YouTube backup server just to make sure that I can get to you. But I'm here now. So hello and welcome to Working With Colour in Affinity Publisher. First things first, make sure that you are receiving this in 720p to ensure the best quality there's a cog down the bottom make sure you've got 20 uh, 720p there and hello to everybody in the chat oh far too many say hello to but hello hello i'm glad that you can be with me if you enjoy tonight please give it a thumbs up it makes a big difference oh i'm hearing that it's looking good and it's sounding good thank you thank you for that terry hello curtis long time no see Right, for those of you who don't know me, my name's Elaine Giles, long-time trainer, podcast host, love my geekery toys, and I've used Affinity applications since the initial beta release, which was Affinity Designer for Mac, but I've actually used Serif products since the early 90s. I even won a competition many, many years ago and won one of their applications. Now, uh, this session follows on from two sessions from three years ago. I couldn't believe that either. But I did a session called Working with Colour and Affinity Designer. And the same night, I did another one with Working with Colour and Affinity Photo. If you have seen one of those, this will all be very familiar. But by popular request, you want one on Working with Colour in Affinity Publisher. So this one completes the set. Now, it's usually based on the other two occasions I've delivered a similar session lasts about 80 to 90 minutes, but stick with it. There's a lot to learn about the colour capabilities of Affinity Publisher. Understanding them will boost your productivity in ways you could only imagine um, and save you time in Affinity Publisher. So when I did those sessions three years ago, I did not mention the Windows version because I am a Mac user, but um, there are some differences, but not that many that you would gain nothing from the session if you are a Windows user. I will point out the major differences as I go. So the majority of what you see will translate perfectly. Right, let's get going then. So Affinity apps, including Affinity Publisher, can use different colour models to represent different ways of describing colour. So that's the first thing to think about. The models are RGB, CMYK, Lab and Grey. And you can select the colour model at the point that you create your file. Don't worry about that, though. You can always change your mind after the event and change it to another way. In Publisher, uh, normally in Designer and Photo, most people are tending to be working in RGB. But... With Publisher, you could well need CMYK output. I have um, a print company that I work with and I have send a lot of stuff to print. Sometimes I'm producing it for PDF and RGB is fine for that. But CMYK is what I would use when I'm sending it to print. Now, that's to do with the colour model that you choose at the point of creating the file. Once you're in the file, then you need to be thinking about the colour picker tools, and that's where we're going to start. There are actually two colour picker tools in Affinity Publisher. There is what I'm going to call the global colour picker, and it's up in the top right hand corner, and that, that at the moment has the colour panel showing. Uh, and you can see there is an eyedropper there. That is actually a tool. The second one is the eyedropper tool, or the colour picker tool, which is in the toolbox. They are very similar and there is a huge overlap, but there's also distinct differences between them. Right, 
So let's have a look uh, at multiple colours and a making colour palette. So this is what we're going to come on to once we've looked at the basics. And if you're following along, you will realise that there will be document palettes, application palettes and system palettes. This is where one of them makes a huge difference if you're on Windows. Um, there are no such thing as system palettes on Windows, hence me using the Apple logo and those logos that you see there, you will see in the interface of Publisher as we start working with them. Then uh, when you think about working with colour, you have a huge range of swatch formats to work with. You have ASE, ACO, CLR, AI. You also have the native affinity format for colour swatches, which is an AF palette file. There are more than that, but they're just, just the common ones there. Now, you may have colour palettes that you wish to use in affinity. And the good news is that you can use some formats natively. And even if you have a swatch file that's not natively supported, so it isn't supported directly by Affinity, you can still use them and I'll show you how. So that's a very broad overview of the areas that we'll cover. Individual tools to work with colour, working with colours as a collection and importing and exporting swatches and dealing with them. So let's go and actually have a look at it. Uh, put your questions in as we go. I am more than happy to answer as we go. So this is Affinity Publisher. Let me know in the chat how long have you been using it? What do you use it for? Let me know. Need to know these things. Right. First thing I'm going to do is start off with an empty file. So file new. Uh, I will choose A4. I'm assuming everybody has seen the new dialog box. It basically now is split up into presets and templates. And then across the top, you have another way of dividing the content, um, which is your presets. So whether they be print or photo or web, I'm going to go for print here and I'm going to go for A4. First thing to think about is this bit over here, which is where your color profile is. That's your starting colour profile. So first of all, you have the colour format to choose from. And then within that, you then have a whole range there to choose from. The default one is this sRGB IEC 61966 2.1. Catchy. Uh, that's just sort of <laughs> the basics that most things can handle. But I may be, um, if I'm printing, looking at doing some CMYK. And then in here, I get a whole different range. Uh, from memory, one of mine is Fogra. <laughs> I think it's a coated Fogra uh, 39. I do believe that that's the one that my printer likes. Uh, but I can deal with all of that later if I want to. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to stick to the default because that may well be what you are using. But at this stage, doesn't actually matter. And create. Now, one question I get a lot is, what if I've done it wrong? Massive air quotes. What if I've picked the wrong one? Um, then you need to go back into up here, your document settings, your spread setup or your preferences, depending on which element you're trying to change. Obviously, the colour is applying to the entire document. So it goes in the document setup. Other people have also said to me, I don't see the document set up. So maybe you have some squares on here and you have selected one of these. And now when you look at the top, you don't see the document set up. You need to make sure that you have selected nothing. So click on the background. It actually says no selection. And at that point, you can go into the document setup, go into color and do what changes you need to do. There is another way to do that. I wouldn't recommend it, but you could do it, which is leave all of that until the end. And then when you come to output your content, so send it to print, which is file export. In here, you have presets and you will see in there that I have my coated Fogra and I actually have my company's called print, Printed Easy and I send it to and I have crop marks only and I have a coated Fogra. And if I'm sending it off to um, every year, we do a brochure uh, and it goes off to Manchester United for print and uh, I have their settings in there as well. And all I do in there is choose the setting 
And when you go into more, it sets up all of that for you. But the reason that I recommend you do it correctly in the first place is so when you're looking at it during the design phase of the creation, it actually looks more or less like you're after. So I would suggest that you do it correctly from the start. And to do that, you need to go into the document setup and set it up in there. Just to be aware that the document that you work with and the document you output could be totally different. Right. OK, let's have a look at some of these tools then. So I've got my my obligatory three squares ish rectangles. Go on, I'll make them the right size because some of you won't be able to focus on anything else unless they're the right size. Right. So I've got some elements that I need to color, basically. Now you have a range you when you access the color tools in Affinity Publisher, they are not all in one place. Now you might think, oh, no, I just want them in one place, but they appear where it's relevant for them to appear and it will save you time down the line. So first of all, you need to look at these tools on the color pan panel panel up there. You have a color panel and you have swatches. So you have two totally distinct panels to start with. The default look for that is that. So when you go into it, yours will probably look like that. And that is called the color wheel. And when I first moved to Affinity Publisher, um, in fact, it, it was before that, because that's the default for Affinity Designer and Affinity Photo as well. But when I first moved to Affinity Designer, I was moving from Sketch and Sketch didn't have that concept of a color wheel. It was sliders. But how the color wheel works. Um, well, first of all, let me show you what you've got here in this part. You actually have what looks like interface elements. They look like they're giving you information. And indeed they are. With the solid white circle at the front, if I click in the color wheel, the color changes in that circle. OK, that's the fill that it's showing you. And as soon as I do that, you can see in here the fill changes of this one that I've got selected. So I change the color on the outer circle, the wheel. And when I'm sort of, yeah, let's have it a kind of purpley color. Then you use the triangle on the inside and that will change the tint of it. So you can have it right up to white. You just move it around the triangle and you get a different tint on the color that you've chosen in the outside wheel. Once you're used to it, that's not actually that bad. Right. But you've got this in the fill here and you may think, well, but there's nothing else. That's just showing me what I've got selected in here. It is. And as you go to another shape, this changes to show you what fill you have in the selected element. Now, some people say to me, I don't like that. I want that to stay as it is. And then I can click on the next one and I can fill it with the same color. Yeah, that would be nice. But it's actually giving you feedback on the element you have selected. So that's why it's changing. You also have here behind that. I'll zoom in so you can see it. Let's get that a bit bigger. There we go. The black bit is the stroke. Now, it doesn't look like there's a stroke on that shape, does it? But if we zoom in, there isn't a, a stroke on it. So why is it saying it's black? Well, in the stroke palette, it's just turned off. But if I just turned it on, it would be the color that is selected in there. And if you want to change that color. So one thing I will do is I'll just make it a bit bigger so we can actually see it. If you want to change the color of the stroke, you need to click on that circle at the back to bring it to the front. And now, as you work around the color wheel here, you'll be able to choose. Oh, yeah, that's terrible. But you get the idea. <laughs> Let's mute it a bit before we blind ourselves. But what you have selected in this part of the interface in the color panel determines which element, so the stroke or the fill, is being adjusted in the color wheel. Now, if you don't want a stroke, you've got a couple of options. You could just click the transparency well next to the colors, and that would have the impact of just putting a transparent fill on them. So that's one way to go about it. 
But the other way to go about it, if, if you're at the point of maybe having a client that can't make their mind up, I have a lot of those. I think I might want one. I'm not sure. Right? And you, you're like, OK, well, this is what it looks like with it. But rather than making it transparent and thus losing the colour, you could just go to the stroke and turn it off. When you turn it back on, it remembers the colour that it was. So just a way of working with the stroke. But we still had an issue, didn't we? We had an issue with this second shape. As soon as I select the second shape, I've lost the colour that I had in here, this, this pinkish purpley colour. I've lost what that was. And that's where this part of the interface comes in here, which literally looks like it's just interface and not a tool. But actually, it's interactive and it's a tool and you can work with it. If you grab this, so I've clicked and I'm holding the left mouse button down and I'm dragging and I hover over there for that colour. When I release it, it loads it into that colour picker tool. Doesn't look like it's done anything other than just load it in there, though, does it? So it's changed that from black to that particular colour. But if I now click it, it will apply. Let's get that the right way around. It will apply that colour to the shape that I have selected. So let's see that again. Here's a shape that's not that colour. It has a grey fill in on it and it has a black stroke on it. But with the fill selected, if I click on that, it will fill it with the colour that I've picked. So in essence, what you've got there is one little colour well that keeps inside it until you add a different colour to it, the one colour you have selected. Now, the principle of how this particular tool works, once you've, you've grasped that, half of the interface of Publisher is now accessible to you because the very same tool is all over the place. If we look in the swatches, it's in there. If we go up to the fill up here, it's in the top corner. If we go to the stroke, it's in the top corner. So throughout the interface, you will see the same tools. And it does the same job. If I grab that one, so we'll go to the fill. It works in exactly the same way. You drag it. I'm still holding the left mouse button down. And as I'm moving over the interface, it's giving me an RGB value, a color value underneath. And as I hover over the purple, it gives me the RGB value of that. The beauty of this tool is you're not limited to the canvas area with it. If I wanted the Affinity Publisher Orange, I could actually go up to the interface and pick that up. And now that is in there. You'll also see that by me selecting it from the fill, the little drop down here, over here on the right hand side, we also have the orange fill and I just need to click it and that will then fill the shape with it. So it's interactive and it's interactive, not just with the canvas area, but with everything else, including elements outside of Affinity Publisher. So if I drag this, I'm getting that RGB. But as I move right outside of Publisher, it's giving me the color of my blue desktop. So I can pick up my blue desktop and color that square with the color of my blue desktop or indeed any other element that's on my interface. So let's go up to there and pick that red off my calendar and apply that. There we are. That is incredibly useful. It also works not just inside Affinity Publisher and outside Affinity Publisher. It works across multiple monitors. So you're going to have to take my word for this, <laughs> but I'm going to drag it across to another monitor where I have my iPhone waiting. Uh, and that's part of the color of the wallpaper of my iPhone. So anything on your screen you can pick up the colour from. So if you've got a document that may be a PDF and you're working with looking at that and then thinking that's the colour I need, you could pick it up from there without knowing what the colour actually was. If you would like that capability outside of Affinity Publisher, there, there, there are apps for that. Um, here's an app that I have uh, and that's going to let me pick up a generic hex code for that. Once I've got that, let me get a square here and I want something very different from it. Uh, oh, dear, that's awful. Right. Uh, you could then use that hex code and in various places in here, you could actually paste it in. But that's only if you want 
to pick up colours and you don't want to use Affinity Publisher for it. If you've got Affinity Publisher, use the tools that are in there because there'll be no copying and pasting. You can just click, 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 and it's a lot easier and a lot faster. Right, so that's it for that tool there. There are differences, as I'm saying, between that and the tool down here, which we will come on to. But you may be forgiven for thinking at this stage, right, got all of that, know exactly what I'm doing, don't need to know anything else. This panel has hidden depths, everything in Affinity Publisher. It, it may look, for some people, they say it looks overbearing. There's a lot of tools. And for others, it's like, oh, it's all a bit simple. What if I wanted to do X? And the thing is, when you're working in Affinity, if you hit a brick wall and you think to yourself, it doesn't do it. Start having a look at the menu options. This tiny menu up here, which is known as a burger menu. If I click on that, it has some options on it. Wheel, sliders, boxes and tint. What that's going to do is completely change the interface of Affinity Publisher inside the colour panel. So if I click on sliders, it changes it. Now it looks more like Sketch. So if you're coming to Affinity, any of the Affinity apps from another app that uses sliders and you're used to using this to set your colours, just change the interface and you can carry on then doing it the way you've been doing it in other applications. If RGB isn't your thing inside the sliders, you also have RGB hex. That's handy. I could paste that number in. And there's there's the purple that I picked up. So you can, uh, other people have said to me, you know, I, I have hex values and I want to paste them in. I can't paste them in. Not on the colour wheel, you can't. But you can if you change it to slider. You also have boxes. And in there you have hue, saturation and lightness that you can change in. This is a little bit more like the colour wheel in that this is acting as the outer circle of the wheel. You select the colour and on the inside, you then choose the precise tint of the colour that you actually want. Um, and then you have your tint, which doesn't look very interesting, but that provides you a colour that's tinted from the original colour. So it's the same colour, but it has a, a different light value in it. That's useful for when you're making um, slides like I did. Should we go back into my slides? And now I'll show you that. Let's go back a bit. Uh, I had a slide, that one. I need three colours. I have a starting point and ending point, but the ones in the middle need to match. They don't, you can really tell if you do that and you think it looks right, but it doesn't. It's not right. You can really tell the difference. So this allows you to pick a colour or change the colour of an element and it not jar with the other objects that you've got. So let's say I've got that one. In fact, we have. We've got three, haven't we? We've got these three here. So let's put a fill on there. We've got that fill on there. I will, at that point, go and pick that one up and I will apply it to the others so they're identical. That first one's going to look slightly different because it's got a border on it, but we'll take that off. They are now all the same. But if what I wanted was to have a nice three, three boxes like I've got on my slide, but I want one to be incredibly pale at this end. Uh, let's take that down. That one is fine as it is, but this one, I need it somewhere between the two. If I just slide it, that makes it perfect. Whereas if I wasn't using the tint, if I was looking at the wheel, I'd be starting to look around and now that doesn't actually match. It's too dark or it just, just doesn't work. <laughs> Thank you for that, Paul. Thank you. Good evening to you. I am indeed from England and I'm very glad that you can understand what I'm explaining because my Spanish is very poor, I'm afraid. I've got literally a handful of words and that's it. None of which would be of any use whatsoever in trying to teach Affinity Publisher. <laughs> right, so basically what I'm saying is if it doesn't work the way you're used to working or the way you would prefer to work, use the menu options, first of all, up at the top. And then within each one, if you want to work in CMYK, you can change it. If you want to do your copy and paste of your hex values, you can do that as well. Right, so that's the first one out of the way. But we also have the second one, don't we? Hmm, now I've got strange things happening on my notes, but never mind. 
Right, we have the second one, which is swatches. Now, I'm going to leave swatches, I think, until I've talked about the other tool. And the reason is, and again, people say to me, why are there two different ones? Why are there colours and why are there swatches? The colour panel is for dealing with individual colours. The swatches panel is for working with multiple colours. So before we go do anything else, I'm going to actually look at this tool, which is the colour picker tool. The colour picker tool is very similar to what you've already been doing, but it does have some very distinct differences. So this one is a dedicated tool. You can get to it by either clicking or you can use the I key, which is the short one, short um, shortcut for it. So first of all, I'm going to select this one here and I'm going to select that tool. Now, this again will let you pick colours from in here. But look at this time. Instead of doing it in a two pass step, which was this. So I have the green and I want that first one green. Step one, go pick it up. Step two, click the shape. Step three, click the colour well. The colour picker tool is much faster. With the item selected, you go and click things. And as you're clicking, it will automatically apply it. It's doing that because up at the top here, in the context sensitive menu, you have apply to selection enabled. If you have apply to selection enabled with that selected, nothing happens here, but things are happening. They're happening up here. So as I click up there, it goes to green. As I click in here, it goes to purple. But by enabling this and choosing an element and then going to click, then it will automatically apply it. So that's the first difference. There is no concept in the color panel of doing that. Right, the second thing to think about is this source here. I would set that to global, to be honest. If you don't set that to global, weirdness happens and you're wondering why. So with this one selected, as I click on here, it makes it green. Just click on there, makes it the purpley color, right. But if I change it from global to current object and I click on the green, it changes it to white. Why is it doing that? And it's doing that because what you've said to it is only use the currently selected object, which is that. That's the currently selected object on this part of the canvas here. There is nothing of this shape showing. So it just picks up white. So it's very, it's intelligent. It's an option. I would tend not to use that because when it happens and it goes white, I think what are you doing? So that's, that's just my preference would be for leaving that set to global. And what that actually means is choose anything that's underneath the mouse pointer. Right. So, so far, so good. And now next thing I need to do is have something better to choose from because I'm going to show you um, getting an average colour. Now, first of all, with this particular tool, as I come out of the area, so as I'm coming out of the canvas, look what's happening. I've got the crosshairs, but as I come out, I've got a mouse pointer, which means selecting colours with the dedicated colour picker tool from the colour panel over here, the tool panel, you can only select elements on the canvas. You cannot select outside of it in the Affinity interface or in the from anywhere else, from my iPhone screen, from my blue desktop. You, you are strictly limited to something that's on the canvas. That's it. So you need to think about that as a limitation of it. But what I will do here, I'm going to place an image. So I'm going to go to I think I dragged and dropped it last time, but but let's do it. Let's do it the place way. And um, oh, as it look would have it, I'm in the right place as well. Only it moves. It automatically changes. Right. I have a photo. I have Bruno, Bruno the dog. I will draw Bruno on here. Look at his face. <laughs> Beautiful image and um, great for colours. So I am going to show you with this what I mean when I say an average colour. So let's get these boxes up out of the way. That one is there, if you remember. I will just put a hideous colour in it so we know that it's there. 
and I'm going to go back to this tool over here. Right. So again, with this selected, I can hover over this image and it will automatically take whatever color I click and fill that box with it because I have my apply to selection turned on and I'm using the eyedropper tool. But what color I actually get in this beautiful brown bit of fur here very much depends because that looks nothing like it. It's far too dark. Uh, maybe I need to go nearer the edge. That's too pasty. What it's doing is it's picking one single individual pixel. And as we zoom in, you can see that even in this lovely light bit, there are darker pixels. So if I click that one, it look really bright. But if I pick, click the pixel next to it, it's actually quite dark. Whereas that fur is a beautiful color, like a golden fire color. What I actually want is like just like that. Make, make, make a color like that. And that's what this radius option is here. It says one by one point and it is. But within it, you can change that to, to an average. An average of three pixels by three pixels, five by five, 17 by 17, all the way up to 257 square. So I'll choose a five by five, which would be about right. And I'll zoom out a bit so we can see the color change in the top left of the canvas and choose that color there. And that is what my eyes are seeing. My eyes are not seeing individual pixels. It's seeing the effect of those pixels being next to each other. So I'm getting an average. If I go over here, I click on the gray bit. I'll get a grayer one. If I go on the edge of the gray and the black, I'll get between the two. If I click on there, I won't get white, nor will I get black. I'll get like a petroly gray color. So that's what this does with the average. The other tool does not do that. If you want an average of a color, then you're going to need to use the color picker tool from the tool panel over there. I love that. I think that is really lovely. I like that. Uh, you can be incredibly precise with it as well. Uh, let's click on this blue one again. And in here, there's actually some blue and purple in the eye. Probably the camera, to be honest. But if I choose that blue bit and zoom out, I will actually get the blue bit. So you can be incredibly precise in terms of getting colours from a picture. Most of the time, if you're wanting to try and pull images from uh, colours from an image, you don't want a specific colour. You do want an average of it. So if you look at the background, it's uh, f like gradient and it's got all kinds of colours in it. What you could do is take that up to sort of 17 and get an average like that. Take an average down the bottom. It's much more likely to be the green. And as you move up, it'll go through yellow. Over there, it's kind of pinkish. And down here, it's sort of bluish, bluish gray. So just really be mindful. If you want an average, there is a way to do it. OK, uh, now what else did I need on there? No, I think we're OK. So understanding the elements within the color panel and the differences between that and what you have in the tools, let's move on to the second panel, which is the swatches panel. Now, as I've said, this is where you're dealing with multiple colors. You could look at it and say, no, they're all individual colors. But if you think about it, when you're working in the color in here, there's no way to say, right, OK, and now I want a red, but not lose the gray. As soon as you try to manipulate that to be giving you some kind of red, you've lost the gray. It is still in the color well up there, but that's not really a safe place to leave it, because as soon as you go and you click something else, you've lost it. That's why there is a swatches panel. And it's tiny and it's a tiny part of the, of the interface. And again, you may think mm, doesn't really look like it does much. It again has hidden depths and mastery of the color and swatches panels will totally change the speed at which you are able to work in Affinity Publisher. So let's have a look at that. You have exactly the same tools and they work in exactly the same way as you have on the color panel. Rationale being, you don't want to have to switch between the two panels to access them. So I won't waste time going over exactly what they do. They do exactly the same as in the color panel and other panels pop out panels like fill and stroke. They do exactly the same. But underneath you have this recent um, thumbnail grid here. 
And that's incredibly handy if you think, oh, I had a green five minutes ago and I've lost it and the green's there. So you can choose a shape and just click the swatch to apply it. But these are transient. Uh, they on you will open up a file and there'll be something there, but you get very little control over what is in there. It's literally what Affinity Publisher thinks are the last few colours that you have used. That's it. But you also have collections of colours. So coming down underneath where it says greys, you have a collection of colours and these don't get deleted. They don't drop off the end when you've used 15 more colours. These stay there for you to use them. You have, as you open it up, greys, colours, gradients. You've got all of these with names here. And at the bottom, you have Pantone. Pantone is an official colour scheme where you choose a Pantone colour and you have complete fidelity with the printed output. So it may well be that you need to use Pantone colours in your work and they are just available from within there. And obviously they don't need me to start fiddling with them and changing them and making my own palettes because they are a standard, a set standard. So I'm going to be concentrating on the three other types of palettes shortly. You can see we have a separator just above Apple and another one above Pantone. And that's indicating that these colour palettes that we're looking at are a different type of colour palette. But in function at the moment, they're fairly similar. So if I click on Apple, I get a standard set of colours from Apple. You would also uh, potentially recognise these colours. It says crayons. You may well have seen crayons elsewhere because they are what you're seeing in here. Some of them are your system palettes. So let me get to the top of here. They have different icons next to them. The top three have an affinity icon. All of these have an Apple icon and it's these that are not available on Windows. And it's not because affinity can't be bothered to make it work. What they're doing on the Mac is hooking into the system wide color palettes and they just don't exist on Windows which is actually most unfortunate, to be honest. Um, it would be great if there was a way of doing that. Maybe it's something that Microsoft can, can think about. Um, now, you need to know the differences between the types of palettes, which I'll look at shortly. But first of all, I'm going to show you what you've got in this dialog box. So you are accustomed to it before we start getting tricky. So you have colours in it and you can use these colours. So you just choose an element and you just click the colour to apply it. It's as simple as that. You also have in here four static colour wells over here. They work exactly the same way. They are transparent, bl black, 50% grey and white. And the reason that they are there is rather than have you have to navigate elsewhere to find transparent 100% black, 100% white and 50% grey. They're there all the time. And if you choose a different colour panel here, those other four are still there. I do actually find that incredibly useful. So it might not seem much, but it, it is incredibly useful. So we'll go back to our Apple one. Other thing to think about is maybe you're working with colours and they're similar. So in here, I actually have a palette that I have created myself. These are all different colours, but without squinting, they're that pale. It's hard to actually tell. One of them is for that. Uh, there are three different colours, the pastel colours here. And as I hover over it, you can see one says All Saints, one says St. Margaret Ward, one says Our Lady of Lords. The colours actually have names. Yes, I took the time to name the colours. It's worth it for two reasons. If you go up to your burger menu on this panel and you click the drop down, you have an appearance as an option and you can have small, medium or large swatch sizes. But you can also choose to show it as a list. And if you show it as a list, you actually get the names. So one says header banner. That's what I'm using for the header. Then I've got 
all our parishes. So that is actually the site colour. And then underneath that, I have the individual church name and I don't need to know that All Saints is pink and St Margaret Ward's is blue and Our Lady of Lords is yellow. If you're wondering why, there's a reason for that. In the finance department, the finance uh, for each church is totally separate. We have different coloured binders. They were red, blue and yellow. So I just made them the pastel versions of that. And now there's logic across the entire thing. But by putting the name in, I don't have to think, oh, which was which? I can't remember. You know, I've actually got the colour and I've got the name. Other reason for bothering with that, first one being in a list, you can read them. But if we were to go back, you say, no, 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 I don't like a list. Uh, but I might want the swatches a little bit bigger. That might help. So if we made them medium, they're a little bit bigger. You have, and again, you might miss this, down here, it's very hard to see, but you can actually search. So if I'm looking for the colour for All Saints, the second I get to All and a space, it's filtered it down to two. One is All Our Churches and the other is All Saints. So as I start typing Saints, it filters it out and that's the colour that I need. And because I have something selected on the canvas, just click on there and it applies it. So two reasons to bother doing it correctly. You also have the ability in here. So let's get, did I do a demo one? I don't believe that I did, but I think I did have an All Saints one, which I can play around with. Right, if I've got a lovely colour up here like this green and I want to reuse that in the future, I've just said don't leave it in the recents and expect to remember that it's there because as you carry on using colours, it'll drop off the end. But what you can do is choose the palette you would like to add that colour green to and make sure you've selected the item which fills it in the fill pot at the top. And then you have this option here that says add current fill to palette. And you click on that and it does add that to the palette. And there's the green. As I hover over that and then right click, you can actually edit the fill so it gets a pop over which has another eyedropper on it. So if you wanted to switch it out for a different colour, you could actually go and pick it with that. Or you could use the sliders. Or you could change the entire interface. And you could have, is your colour wheel there? There's your colour wheel. You could change that colour using any of the tools that we've already seen in the colour panel. So it's like Russian dolls, this. Right, so we've added a colour to it as well. Now, also in there with the colour, if we right click it, not only can you edit the fill, but you can rename it. So at the moment it's called All Saints. It's picked that up from the panel name. And I might want that for um, summer events. So I literally name the colour summer events. And as I hover over that, it tells me it's summer events. Right. So at the moment, we're just adding to this. We've also got up here things that we can do up here. So first, I'm going to show you. Uh, you can actually rename the entire palette. So at the moment, that's All Saints. But if I wanted that to be Churches. In the colour wheel, got a question coming in. In the colour wheel, there is noise. What's the benefit of adding noise to the colour versus adding noise via a filter or something else later? Personal preference, really. Um, I would tend to do it via a filter later, but it's completely up to you. There may be edge cases where, depending on how you're sending it for print, it needs to be done one way rather than another. Um, but if, if you're doing standard printing, then it's pretty much up to you how you actually do that. Right. So we've seen how we can add to a palette. Um, if I hover over there, you can also see I can delete from there. So let's delete the green. It will warn you before you do it, but I will delete it. So you get an idea for how you're actually working in here. But the fundamental thing to understand, which will make your entire life a whole lot easier is about the different type of colour palettes that you have. So as I click the drop down in here, I said we had the greys, the colours and the gradients. And then we had all of this selection and then we had the Pantone. The three at the top are application palettes. They only exist within Affinity Publisher. 
The icon next to them is the serif icon, not the publisher icon, but actually the serif icon itself. They are indicating that they are application level palettes. So they are available within Affinity Publisher, but they're not available anywhere else. The next ones, the Apple system, Affinity, etc. These are system palettes on a Mac. Now, you what you need to do when you create a palette, an entire palette of your own, is to decide what type of palette you should create. So do you want it to be available only in Affinity Publisher, in which case you'd be creating one similar to the three at the top, which is the application palette? Or would you like it available elsewhere? So that's your first fundamental decision to make. There is one more thing to think about after that. But at the moment, we'll leave it at that. Right. In here, you can see I have Apple and System and Affinity. Some of these were created by applications. So ScreenFlow created a ScreenFlow palette. And although you'd think, well, that would be there in ScreenFlow. Yes, it would be. But it's also available globally. I created the Notion one. I created the assets for the Blue Yeti one. I created all of these Microsoft ones. Scrivener created Scrivener. So Scrivener actually created that palette. But when I click it, um, if you use Scrivener, you may be aware of where these are from. These are your highlight colors in Scrivener. And because it's made as a system palette, it means that you can actually use them in your design work just because it's a system palette. Um, what else have I got in here? Uh, I've got another Blue Yeti one. Yep, those are the colours for my Blue Yeti course. And those are the assets for my Blue Yeti course. Uh, I think I duplicated that. They could just as easily be one. But which type of palette should you create? Now, I actually have somewhere, although it would appear to have disappeared. Did I shut that finder window? Looks like I did. That was clever. Right, um, working with data. I have a file here, which is a pages file. And I'm just going to show you before I fully explain about palettes. Are you thinking of opening this application? There we are. Right. In here, I have these shapes and they are just the default color. There you go. All the same, just the default color. But over here, I can change the color of them. There's a few ways that I can do that. But there is a drop down and I can just choose a different color in there. But what if what I was designing here in pages, so maybe I'm writing a report for the client and I want to make reference to the fact of, you know, we've picked these five colors. You'd be thinking I've got to go back to publisher and then I'll have to export that as something else and I'll have to bring it in as a graphic. But no, you don't. We've got some color worlds, come some squares here that we can put some color in and over here, if I want to pick, it's disappeared, it's gone over the other screen, but I'm going to bring it in. There is the colour picker. And within here, you actually have access. So I don't know if you're familiar with all of these, but in the third option at the top, which is your colour palettes, they are exactly the same ones that you would see in Affinity Publisher. So it's a bi-directional thing. So if I wanted to use my assets for the Blue Yeti, there they are. That's the colour for the poster. And I didn't bother naming these, which I probably should have done. But look what's happening as I'm selecting them. What's selected in the interface is picking up the colour from in here. And all I need to do is actually just go through and I don't even need to go back over here to hook it up. If you've never used this, here's what's happening. I'm going to leave that there and select a shape. Over here, as you click on the drop down, you're just changing that individual shape. But when you click on this little thing here, this palette wheel, it says click to show more colors. What it means is as you click there, it will bring up the, the system wide color palette over here. For some reason known to itself, it always puts it on my third monitor. So I have to drag it back in. But when you push that in, you get a blue border around it. The background of it goes blue. That's telling you that you're now locked on to the color palette. And what that means is 
as you switch between shapes, it stays deep blue on the right and you can just pick a color and keep picking a color and you can even change the palettes. So we'll go in there and we'll choose all of these. See all my pastel shades and only when you're finished. So I've done everything's in there. You then toggle that off. So when you're making that decision as to whether you what type of colour palette you make, you need to be thinking, where do I want to use it? Most of the time for me, it makes sense to have it as a system palette, but there could be a huge disadvantage to that. So while I get back into Affinity Publisher and get to the point of showing you why, um, put in the chat if you know why. Why could it possibly be a disadvantage to creating a system palette so it's available in all your applications. Why could that ever be wrong? You let me know in the chat. Right, so I'm going to lose this. Uh, we will save uh, whatever you need to do. Away you go. Right, so we're back in here. So just to prove the point, these were all the palettes that we looked at. So we're about to make a palette for this document. Um, it could be for a client. You've just got to make your mind up what type of palette you're going to create. So first of all, I think we can rule out an application palette because an application palette would make the colours available only inside Affinity Publisher, but for every future document that you create. And if this is for a client, you're probably not going to need that. Uh, not at application level, but it's up to you. You could if you wanted to. Right. So the next decision is, should it therefore be a system palette? Most of the time for me, as you can see, I've made quite a few of my own. I'd probably do it that way, except in one circumstance. Right. Uh, let's have a look if anybody said nobody's got the answer in the chat. Oh, no. Well, if I make it a system palette and it's for my client, and I then need to go away. You remember when we used to go on holiday and things like that, leave the building. Um, I'm going away and I'm taking my laptop with me. Where's the colour palette? It's a system palette and it's on this computer and it's nowhere else. Oh, dear. You can back them up, you can transfer them, but that's like magic that we're going to look at shortly. But you would need to do something manually to take it with you. If this is a document that you're working on and you think I'm going to use these colours in this document, there is an ability to create a third type of palette, which is a document palette. The difference between a document palette and a system palette is the document palette lives inside the document, which means when you save this and hand it off to somebody else, another designer, they can open it up and that palette will be there for them to work with, which could be a huge time saver. The only other way of doing that would be to export your system palette and put it with the file and then send it over and then they've got to import it and do all kinds of things. So when it comes to creating this, that's what we'll do. OK, I've seen a question or not particularly a question, more of a comment, which is from Kelly, who says it's too hard to follow. Uh, and Paul said, how can we help? So that's a very good point, Paul. How can we help? What's proving to be confusing here? Um, are you already using Affinity Publisher? Is, is Affinity Publisher new to you? Are you on Windows? Are you on a Mac? Let us know that information and we'll try and help out. Uh, give us some information, what precisely the problem is, and we'll have a chat about it. Right, so I need to decide what I'm doing in terms of creating a palette. So I go up to that menu and I have the ability to create three palette types. Application, document, system. You'll notice not the ability to make a Pantone. That's already a, a set system and you do not play with it. But we've ruled out an application palette because that would just lock it into Affinity Publisher. It's going to be either a document or a system. I'll make it, first of all, a system wide palette. So it's as simple as that to create it. You've done it. It gives you an unnamed palette with a little Apple logo. The Apple logo is telling you it's a system palette. That's what it means. Now, first thing to do, rename that. 
I wish it would stop and ask you to name it, but you have to go back to the top and you have to say rename palette. So we'll call this a demo palette and OK. And then you have a completely empty set of swatches. You just go around, pick the colours that you want and then add them in there. So it's this button that we've used before. All you need to do, make a selection, add, make a selection, add. If you would like to pick one from here, you could go in here and choose one. That will add it up there. And from there, you can add that as well. So just go around, click, click them and add them in. Now, remember at this point, uh, it's good practice to name them. If you don't, it takes the name of the palette and adds a number onto it. And that's it. So I would actually, it didn't like that, but I would actually do that. Um, take the time to do it like I did with the churches, like I did with Microsoft products and things that make sense to you. Now, other thing to think about. One thing you can't do unless you have a document palette is some magic. And we do like magic, don't we? So I'm going to concentrate on these three squares here and we'll do some magic with them. Let's say that what we want is to have these three shapes of the same colour. Well, you know how we can do that. We added this one to this demo palette. So if we add the second one and click there and the third one and click there, awesome stuff. They are now all the same colour. But just imagine that this is inside a file for a client. And then they decide that they want that green. Remember that green. Luckily, it's up there. So I add the green back and then I could even say add it to the palette in case they change the mind again. And then I need to select each one and go through and recolor it. OK, not too bad if it's something like that, but it could be text. It, it could be anything that now needs recoloring. So this third type of palette that there is. If I've got that selected and I go up here. I do not have a document palette at the moment. Proof of that is if I click on here and scroll, I only have the icons for the Apple logo and the Serif logo. I do not have anything other than that. But I do have the option in here from the menu to add a global color. Now, global colors can only exist within document palettes. But you don't need to create a document palette first. If you choose add a global color, it will make a document palette for you or you could choose to make a document palette. It's up to you. But I'll click add global color and it will come up and it will say global color. And I will choose what I want here. So shall we go for a kind of bluishy purpley thing? Uh, let's go for something like that. It's called Global Colour 1, which is neither used to man nor beast. So we'll call that uh, Primary Colour. Primary. And click Add. And at that point, more than one thing has happened. So let's check out everything that's happened. Over here, we now have a different type of palette because it's got a document icon next to it and it says Document. Underneath that, we have the colour that we added but it's got this funny symbol in the corner. The white triangle in the corner means it's a global colour. That's all it means. We also have here, we had this, which was to add the current fill to the palette, but now we've acquired this, which is add the colour to a palette as a global colour. So now we've got two alternatives. If I change this to an application palette, that option disappears. If I change it to a system palette, that option disappears. So the option is only there on document palettes. But if I go through and I want to add this green as a global color, I can click there and it will actually do it. And we know it's a global color because it's got the white triangle in the lower corner. So far, so good. But what's a global color and why do you care? Well, we go back to these three shapes and I said my client wanted them this purpley colour. So I apply the purpley colour. Then they decide that's not quite the right shade of purple. 
Now, if they wanted it green, obviously I, I'm going to need to select it and then hit the other color palette, uh, the other color option. But if it's just a couple of shades wrong, so let's click on here and edit the fill. Um, we want it more pinky, so we need to move this. Or maybe they want it yellow. And look what's happening. All three are changing. They are not changing because I have them selected. They are changing because the fill is a global fill. And a global fill, when you make changes to it, automatically um, changes the whole lot. I'm being told in the chat, <laughs> because Tracy's arrived, who speaks impeccable Spanish, that um, Art Valor was saying I have a beautiful accent. Thank you for the translation and thank you very much for the comment. It's much appreciated. So global colours are fantastic. They are your friend, even for something as simple as that. But they come into their own when you have a real file. So I'll open up a real file that I have somewhere over here. Don't tell me my real file has disappeared. That would not be good. But I had it open not long ago. Um, did I call it demo? I think I called it brand kit. Right. This is a file that has in it an entire brand kit for our churches. And you can see the colour is maroon. They like maroon. Lots of maroon. But I also did an alternative, which was black. And over here... And I suggest when you open an Affinity Publisher file, go and check out if it has a document palette, because if it does, it's going to save you a ton of time. This one has, it's called document, but it could be called anything, and it has two global colours in it. It has black and it has maroon. So if I show you here, uh, I've got the text in the brochure, which is the first six pages. I have a with complement slip. And I have this A4 page and a continuation page. Continuation page just has this strip on it. But I can tell when I click on it, it has that global colour applied because it lights up in blue around the edge. So with all of that showing, let's get as much showing as I can. If I go into here and they decide maroon is so yesterday and they want some kind of green. Why is that not moving? Oh, that is not good. Oh, though, there we go. It's caught up. Probably wanted a darker green than that. It's a little bit slow catching up that, but it is actually catching up. You can see that the with complement slips updated. This is updated. The continuation page is updated. And if I scroll, even all of the text in that brochure has updated. There is, however, in here one thing that didn't. And that was on that page there down the bottom. I converted this to a global colour and I forgot to apply it to that bit. So that had the correct colour, but it did not have a global colour. Once it's got the global colour and I go in and I change that global colour. Uh, let's make it a, a deeper blue like that. Then the whole lot will change. You can see it updating over here. The brochures, that blue is not good, is it? Oh, dear. But the whole lot has changed. So global colours are amazing. If you have an opportunity to use a global colour, take that opportunity. What that means for us in here is that we needed a document palette, but we've now got a document palette. So document palettes will enable us to change our mind about the colour completely. So let's say we want this dark colour as an accent colour. But we still want the blue. We still want this one, but we want this one as well. At the moment, that's not a global colour. You can add it to the palette, but look at the difference. Without the triangle, not a global colour. Proving the point, if I go in here and I start playing around with it, it doesn't change anything that's already got that colour applied to it, even though in here it's now day glow orange. Well, a yellowy colour. So that's not a global colour. But if we go back, this is still selected and we hit add as a global colour and we do get that little shape on it. Once we go into that now and start playing around, it automatically updates. So that's the distinction between global colours and standard colours. Very, very important. And incredibly useful to you as well.
Now, at the moment with these, that document palette will travel with this file. But these other ones won't. So if I was using the, the Microsoft one, lots and lots of lovely Microsoft. Uh, they are all the colours, believe it or not, for the applications. Um, they're all named. All the applications in there. So if I want, the if I want Word, that's the Word colour. Um, Excel will be in here somewhere. Uh, it would help if they're alphabetical, wouldn't it? But hang on, I think I saw the Excel one. There's the Excel green. So that is what I would use that for. But I'm using it here. If I then hand that off to Mike, he does not have access to any of those colours. He has no idea which the right colour is. So what you can do up here is you can export a palette. And when you export it, let's put it on the desktop. Uh, and it, it takes the name that the colour palette is, Microsoft, and export it. And then to show you on the desktop, I have there a colour palette. It is a CLR file. CLR file being the inbuilt colour palettes on your Mac. Some of you may, slightly aside here, uh, let me get a window up and show you. You may have a Mac, like I know we have somebody with us tonight who's getting a new one tomorrow. And if he had all his colour palettes listed on his system, they would not transfer unless he's doing one of those restore things that never works well. So you may want to transfer all of the colour palettes that you have. To do that, you go to Go and Library. This will obviously be in a different place on Windows, but in on a Mac, you go to Colours and there are all the colour palettes that you have on your system. They are something that's worth backing up once a month or so. Um, what I tend to do with them is just that. It creates an archive file. Um, they are incredibly tiny. So that zip file will be very tiny. And I call it colours and I put a date on it. And that's my backup. And then I will just sling it somewhere like OneDrive or Box or somewhere <coughs> just to back it up. And now they are backed up. If I wanted to share any of these with you, I could just ping you that and it would work. So we have over here the Microsoft one. If I were to nuke the Microsoft one in here like that, it's gone. Let's empty the trash. It's gone. No Microsoft. In here, it's still there. Go to our parishes. Let's go back to Microsoft. It's still there. It reads them in as soon as you open the application. But I'm going to do a demo there to save that. Don't put it there, but never mind. And come out of the application. Uh, don't need to save that. Let's go back into Affinity Publisher and see if that Microsoft palette is still there. It should not still be there. It'd be a terrible demo now if it was. But what can I do? <laughs> right. So let's open up our file. I had demo two. There it is. And if I go back over here, I do not have Microsoft. I have Microsoft Office 2017. I do not have Microsoft. But if I go up here and I do an import, I get to choose import it as what? So an application palette, a document palette or a system palette. Now I'm going to do it as a system palette because it started life as a system palette and it's on my desktop. It's the one that I exported and this has got a mind of its own. Right, there we are. And open that. It will think about it. It will import it. And there it is at the bottom of the list. And that's the right one. It's got all of the names in there. The other one that I had was Microsoft 2017. So you can export palettes and you can import palettes. But you should be screaming at me at this point. That's all very well. But these are CLR files, which if you look at them, the kind is an Apple color list. No one's using that on Windows, are they? nor are they Adobe Swatch Exchange files. We have lots of other uh, palettes types that we have. We have ACO, we have ASE, uh, you've seen we have CLR. So there's lots of different file types 
And some of these are supported directly and some are not. This is the problem with it. So what I'm going to do is we have got this Our Parishes one there. So one thing that I can do is just totally delete that. In fact, I shouldn't have actually closed that window, should I? What I'm going to do is I'm going to delete that one. So that's in here. It's in colours. It was the Our Parishes one. I will delete it. I will empty the trash. It's gone. Right. I will need to restart this because it reads it in at the beginning. I will then start Affinity Publisher. And we'll see what we can do with the fact that we need to bring something in that's not a native file. When it finally starts. Excellent. Right. And let's get that file open again. Our demo two file. Right. And I did have it over there, but it has uh, decided otherwise. So let's get back to where we were, which was here. We have all of these. So the Our Parishes one we deleted is there. Now that actually tells you it's an Adobe Swatch file, a Swatch Exchange file. It does not give you a preview. It's not that clever. All that is, is the ASE icon. So what we need to do in our swatches is go to the burger menu and down to import and we'll import it as a system palette. And it's going to the desktop, which sadly is not where this actually is, nor is it there. Uh, that's my default folder. But where it is, is in my Google Drive, in my working with colour data, in my colour palettes. Go on, you know you can open it. Right. Now, this shows us something quite interesting. The top one is dimmed out. You cannot import that. So sadly, Golden Beach, not going to see that then, are we? But the Adobe Swatch Exchange files are supported and the colour list files from Apple are supported. So the one that we were interested in was the Our Parishes one. So this is an Adobe Swatch Exchange file. You can download these from the Internet. There's thousands of them. And hit open and it will actually import it. And now we have in here our palette. We have, however, lost there the names. So the swatch exchange that I had clearly either didn't have the names in or it's ripped the names out. But the colours are there. So you can import Adobe Swatch Exchange files. That's the key thing. What you can't import, unfortunately, is the more modern kind. So in here, this Golden Beach one, this one, if I open, uh, let's change that so we can see the full name of it. It will show you that this one, the Swatch Exchange is one type, but this one is an Adobe Photoshop Swatches file. And this is a more modern file. Adobe have moved away from the Swatch Exchange files to these ACEO files. Um, I don't know why. I don't know what their rationale is, nor do am I aware of why you can't just import it. One explanation would be that Adobe don't let you read it unless it's an Adobe, applic Adobe application. But given the fact we should be able to open that with other things, I don't think that's actually the reason. So I have no idea why you can't directly open this. But if a client has sent you that and said, well, the old designer used this and you are trying to open it and you're like, I can't open it, then that does not make you look good. But luckily, there is an application which is Colour Palette Converter. Um, I think it's, I've got the link, which I will put in the description to the video later. Um, it's inexpensive. It's from the Mac App Store. So again, it is a Mac application, I'm afraid. I don't know of one for Windows, but if you do, please feel free to put a comment. Um, and what I'm going to do is it said drop palette here and it supports the four types there. So you've got your ACO, your ASE, your CLR and a swatches file. So I drag and drop that file. Now, this is a really useful application to have, even if you're not particularly converting things from formats it can't read. Because what you can do in here is you can actually start naming these things. So in there where that's beige E, if we wanted like milky coffee and we wanted sort of pale dawn, that's the kind of names we have, isn't it? <laughs> Oh, I'm getting sidetracked now with naming things. But you can see there's 10 colours in it. Uh, top four were just beige, but now they're not. Um, you can name them and then you get an option of importing it. So at the moment it says new palette 
and it's going to be called Golden Beach. And literally all you would need to do is hit the import button. Now, when it says import, whoa, where's it importing it? It's going to be a system palette at system level in the folder we've already seen on the Mac. And it will create a completely new palette. However, you do have an option to add it to an existing palette if you want. So if you had some more colours from a client, um, say, say the Alparishes one, we, we've decided we want honey, red honey for a church. Lovely. Uh, then I could import it into an existing colour swatches set. But I'm going to make a new one called Golden Beach. So all I'm going to do is hit import on that. So remember what we've done. Um, well, at this stage, it's going to start prompting me. Right. Um, it says save to and it's got library colours folder. So it knows where the default ones are. They're in there. Uh, and I'm just going to say yes to that. That's where I want it. It's saying it's saved. You can edit it on the colour panel after restarting the target application. So I'm going to need to restart again for it to be there. But hopefully it will actually be there. And you can carry on editing that now. What it what it was meaning was you can use the system colour palette um, tool to edit it. So I am I'm going to bring that one back. And in here we should have a golden beach. Where's golden beach? Ah, I need to restart the app that that is actually coming from. And at the moment, that's coming from Keynote. That's a really bad idea to try restarting Keynote, isn't it? In the middle of a presentation. I'll do it anyway. It's thinking about it. Right. There we go. It's the top one. Let's get that out of the way and get the colour palette up. So over here we go. And I'll bring it back. And there it is. And at this time... I'm hoping Golden Beach is there. There it is. There's the Pale Dawn that I named. There is the Milky Coffee that I named. And that is available in any application. This is a really useful thing to have no matter what, uh, but particularly for these newer style Adobe Photoshop files that there's no other way to edit. So it's in there. Let's bring back Publisher. It shouldn't be in there yet, unless it's had a rare old think and done it. No, nope. it needs to restart. So you always do need to restart the thing. But it's a fantastic and cost effective way to switch between file formats that Affinity Design, Affinity Publisher doesn't natively support and files that your clients are likely to give you. So let's make sure that that's available in here as a system palette. And there is Golden Beach. There we go. I am quite liking Crisp Mint. I like that. OK, so that's importing and exporting. But it could get more complicated than that, couldn't it? Um, one thing would be something like this here, that lovely photo of Bruno. What if I wanted to have some assets to put around a photo of Bruno in an Affinity Publisher file? I would like the text, maybe, and some block elements to complement that image. And actually, the ones we've got up here, not bad at the moment, but obviously these don't particularly um, go well, do they? Like the dark ones and no, not great. The other ones were, were far better. So what I need palette from document? Useful. But to do that, I'd actually have to delete these because it's going to take them from there as well. But let's just do it. Let's just do it. We'll put some extra ones in and make them twice as hideous. So let's um, have the garish yellow and let's have that purpley thing back. And let's have the crisp mint because I like it. OK, so that's our document at the moment. There are other ways that you could do this, though. So I'm going to open my Office Summit file and I'm going to do it in that one as well after we've done this simple one just to show you. But we'll do it with this one. So up to the burger menu and down to create palette from document. Uh, really doesn't matter which one you choose, but I'm going to create this as a document palette. And it creates for me a color palette up here with lots and lots of colours in, all coming from this document. It's called it Demo2 because that's the file name and it's named the colours just numerically from one to however many it's made. So that's it doing it. You now have a range of colours. 
If this was vector and it was all solid colours like that, you would have fewer of them. It's because we've got this image in. But for something like this file where I've got orange because it's Office and I've got blue because it's OneDrive and green because it's Excel. Let's do another one there and make a document palette. It's quickly done it and there are all the colours that I have inside this file. So if a client gives me a file like this and there's no palette, that's a quick way to make one. There is still yet another way to do it, which is even better, which is from within here, choose create palette from image. Now, this needs you. It's like a it's like an application inside an application, this one because you've got this select image option where you can go out and actually choose the file. And I need my drive with my demo data in it up here. And I have Bruno. There's Bruno. So open up that. It brings up Bruno. It initially picks five colors. That's changeable. You can have up to 256. I don't suggest you go that far. Choose your number. Click preview and it gives you a preview of the colours that it has picked. The ones that it thinks are most representative of that image. And it's done a pretty good job. The next thing you need to do is to choose a location. So you either want an application palette, a system palette or a document palette. You get an extra one this time, though, which is the currently selected palette. So I'm going to go for another document palette, though, and click create. And it uses the name of the file, Bruno, and it puts in all of the colours that it has picked from that image. So let's do that one more time with a completely different image. So um, from image and we will choose the peachy one, I think. But that will move because I've got it set to automatically move and it drives me mad. Even when I move back, it moves again. Right. Let's choose the peach image and open up that one. Those are the five it's chosen, but let's say I want 10. Instead of using the slider, I can actually type in the number that I want. So type in 10. Uh, do a preview, get those 10 colours. If I'm happy with those 10 colours, which I'm thinking I'm not seeing that pink. I wonder where it's picked that up from. Hmm, I might want to redo that. I might want to dump one off. Should we, take, should we go for nine and see if it dumps the pink? No, it's insistent that I'm going to have that pink, isn't it? What would it do if I pick five like it was before? Yeah, it picks the same five. Let's go for five. Let's make it document. Let's say create. And we now have peach with the number. So that was the name of the file. And we have one, two, three, four and five. So you can even create your own color palette from an external image that you may have. So we've done importing the swatch exchanges and the color files and from the color picker. We've also done exporting them. Uh, but what I'm going to do here is I'm going to export. So go to file export and I've got peach selected. So I'm going to save that and put it on the desktop. So save that one. I'm also going to go in and choose the Bruno one and export Bruno. So again, export palette and export that as Bruno. Now, you should at this point notice a bit of a difference, which is the Microsoft one that I had exported as a CLR. But these two have exported as AF palette files. Why? What's the difference? How did that happen? And it was because this Microsoft one was a system palette. System palettes are stored as CLRs. These two were document palettes. And when they're exported, they're exported as AF palette files. If you're trying to share design work that you have done with somebody using Photoshop, they will not thank you for sending them an AF palette file, because the only thing that can read an AF palette file is an um, an affinity application. What to do then? If that happens to you and you need to get this Bruno exported as something else, then what you need to do is convert this. Make sure that you create a palette called Bruno that is a system palette um, or some other format. And then you need to take it out and then you need to convert it for them. 
So if you export these AF palette files for yourself or somebody else who's using Affinity, that's fine. And they'll work on photo and designer and publisher. Not a problem at all. You would just have to think about uh, if you were trying to share it with people. Affinity palettes do not share well. They don't share well. Now, uh, when it comes to other colours, I've got a couple of other things to show you. So probably another 10 minutes-ish, but so worth it. So worth it. Plus the fact I have managed to keep my iPhone alive for this demonstration and I'm determined to do it. It's as simple as that. Right. Uh, let me show you this. It's other, it's other places really to get colours from. Uh, one is if you have your iPhone or any other kind of phone that supports what I'm about to do with it. So let me get that on there. That's my iPhone. It's been sat there all night ready for its demonstration, poor thing. Um, I ha there is an application called Adobe Capture. It's free. Don't worry. You do need an Adobe application, um, an Adobe account to do what I'm doing now, but a free account is fine. So I'm going to open that up and there, my post-it notes. You know I love my post-it notes. There's the rest of my desk as well. There you go. There's you in the chat right now. But I have my post-it notes. And what I'd like is to make a palette from my post-it notes. So as you move around, you can see all these balls bouncing and you need to get that into a location where you're happy with it. And four out of those aren't bad. So I'm going to tap the screen once and that has unfrozen it. Uh, that's frozen the screen. And in the freezing of it, actually, that that top pink one on the left isn't at all bad. But what you can do with it uh, when you think, yeah, that's OK. But maybe I want to have a play around with that pink one. You can tap and move the ball. And you'll get a totally different color in the top right swatch. So the, all of these balls are live for you to play with like that. So initially we had that quite muted, didn't we? It was a muted color, probably around here somewhere. So let's say it picked there and I think, whoa, that's way too dark. You just move the ball where you would like it to go. When you're happy with it, you tap the tick at the bottom and it takes you through and it shows you the colours. So I'm looking at those and I'm thinking not bad, but I think the fourth one. So as I tap it, it gets a frame on it. I think the fourth one should be a little bit brighter and I can do that by altering the RGB value using the sliders. So that's kind of turning it a bit more green, isn't it? Um, I need it less green and more yellow. So let's take the yellow up over there and the green one, which is the third one that could do with being a bit brighter as well. So I'll take that up. And now I've done that. I need to do it with a purpley one, too. Great. I'm happy now. Only apart from that needs to be more orangey. <laughs> there we go. Now it looks like my post-it notes. Excellent. So at that point, I've created. Or I'm about, well, I have created it, but I'm about to save um, the palette. So tap save. And you get the option here, you are going to be able to um, rename it. So I'm going to call that post it. Post it. There we go. No, don't auto correct it. But if you insist, right, post it. So I've done that. Then I need to choose where I'm saving it to. And I have a whole list of folders that I can save it to. Um, I might as well stick this in Magbytes, mightn't I? So it's in Magbytes. And I tap save. Now, what it's done with that is it stuck it. Oh, here we go. Whee! No, I mustn't get sidetracked. I mustn't. I must put it down. Let's put it down on the desk and let's get that out of the way. Where it's and when you go to color.adobe.com, uh, initially you'll be shown this, which is the create color wheel. And this is a completely free thing. You can play around with it, make your own colors and save them. But obviously they've been saved up to the cloud. In here, I can also go to my libraries and in my libraries, I have my MacBytes one. Where is my MacBytes one? There we go. And there's my post-its color. There they are. And from this point, I can do quite a bit with it from here. I could download it as an ASE, which you know I can import, but I can also copy it as less CSS, SAS, XML. I could publish it. I could edit it. I could do all kinds of stuff with it. Um, I could copy the value here, the hex value, and I could use it in that way. Um, one of the things I would do, I would probably download it as an ASE because that's shareable as it is. 
But if you're looking at other people's, if you're doing this in, in um, there's another app, like another, uh, no, 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 I need Firefox for that because I've already logged in and that took me all night, believe you me. I have over here, let's get that out of the way. I have another app, another website which works similar to this. So let's get that up. And in here you can just search for colours. So that fruit sorbet is quite nice. Or you can search for them. And again, from here, you can download them. So there are many sites that you can do this on. Adobe is one. Colour Lovers is another. But mine, the reason I went with the Adobe one is because those colours came from a photograph that I'd taken with my iPhone. That was the reason. But I downloaded it as an ASE. So if I move that out of the way and we look at the desktop, uh, where's my ASE? Oh, it's probably gone in the downloads folder, hasn't it? Let's go get it from the downloads folder. There is my file. Oh, it was in my downloads folder. So Adobe, Adobe Color, saying it's come from Adobe Color and post it ASE. Right, let's go back to Publisher. And Publisher's on the other screen. Let's bring that to the left. In fact, we can go full screen with that, can't we? And we can go up there. We can go to Import Palette. We'll go for another document palette. It really doesn't matter. It's opened up the um, file open dialog. I'm confusing it tonight. It's opened it up on the wrong screen. But uh, what do you mean you failed to open it? Um, an ASE is supported. I assure you it is. There we go. And there's our post-it notes colours. So that was taken live from a photograph from my phone, uh, passed through the Adobe system. I'm sure I'm really popular with Adobe, showing, showing you how to use a free application to make Affinity Publisher even better. But uh, do this anywhere. Uh, let's just do it on here, but you could do it anywhere. I have an application called Snappy App. And Snappy App lets me take a screenshot, just like that, of part of that. And it puts the palette, it leaves it floating. So I can either use that, uh, let's say I want to get this blue one. And remember, this will pick up anything from the interface. So I leave that hovering and then I can just use it like that. Snappy App is absolutely free and it's pretty amazing. I do love Snappy App. I must admit, I love that. Why, why are we not working now? Why are we not working here? What is going on? That's yellow and you should be yellow. But you're not quite yellow, are you? I have no idea with that, but we'll uh, get that out of the way. So there is a lot to think about when you think about colour in Affinity Publisher. A lot to think about. So I'm getting my phone out of the way because it's in the way. And um, let's get back into here. And do a recap. So we've looked at RGB, CMYK, lab colour, grey colour. These are your colour um, models that represent different ways of describing colour. We also went through the colour panel and it's interactive elements that don't look interactive at all because they change when you select elements in the interface, not just when you click them. So you need to be aware that they're actually alive and they do things. You have your colour wheel, your HSL colour wheel, which is the default view for the colour panel. But there are alternative options where you have wheels and sliders and boxes and tints and all kinds of other things. You can change it so you have sliders, so it's more compatible with other applications that you may be using. You also have the ability to use boxes. Uh, again, it's just a different way of working with colour. So use the one that you are more comfortable with. The tint was useful when we wanted to try and find a mid colour um, from a range of colours. So a starting point and end point was fine, but we had boxes in the middle and we wanted to find a decent mid colour. And we just filled it with either the first colour or the second and then use the slider to adjust it and create a third colour. You also have the um, default eyedropper come colour picker tool, which is in the toolbox on the left hand side of the screen. Difference with that one, there were actually quite a few differences, which we will look at in a moment. Uh, there's the default profile we looked at, which was the one that you use when you start, but we said you could change it as and when you get going with it. But it is the suggested default colour. So that's what it always seems to start as. And for most jobs, it works well, unless you're looking to send it out to print, in which case I have to convert all of mine to CMYK. Now, the two colour pickers, 
The colour picker, which is in the pervasive one, the one that's in all the dialog boxes, the colour panel, the swatches panel and other tools, lets you select from anywhere on the screen, including multiple screens. But the downside of that is it's a two step process. You have to click the tool, hold your mouse button down and drag it to where you need it. That loads the colour into the colour well and then you go back and click it to apply that colour to an object. But that one is pervasive across the interface. It works exactly the same way in multiple locations. Colour Picker tool is only letting you pick from the design area. But it's a single step process as long as you have the tick in the box that makes it happen automatically. You can also have presets in there. And the biggest thing is it will let you select an average colour. Then we looked at handling multiple colours. Um, there are three types of palette that are supported. Document palettes, which live inside the document. So they travel with the document. If you are into photography and you have used sidecar files, it's a little bit like that. They are embedded within the Affinity Publisher document. Application palettes are Mac only and they live on your Mac. If you want to work with the same file on another computer, you're going to need to take those files with you. You need to do some exporting. Uh, what we do, we have a folder in Dropbox and it's my application palettes and I drag and drop them in there at a regular basis and then they're available in Dropbox anytime I need. Um, oh no, I'm talking rubbish there. <laughs> That's a system palette. That's a system palette. An application palette is the one that lives inside on an individual machine. They are supported on Windows. They are only available on the single machine you're working on. And to use them anywhere else, you have got to export them. Everything I just said, that was about the system palette. They are Mac only. I wish they were on Windows. They're incredibly powerful. I really wish they were on Windows. Um, you can use them as long as they are exported. So if you have one on your system and you think, oh, I, need to, I need to hand this off to a Windows developer, you can do that. You just need some of the tools that we looked at where you can export and convert. Um, shared swatches, they do love each other. <laughs> um, Combined workflows are possible. It's not as difficult as people would make out. But uh, I put Photoshop there and then I've put um, Affinity Publisher. Basically, what I'm saying is any Affinity swatches can be shared with any Adobe things. You just need to think about it and convert them. Adobe uses ASE, Adobe Swatch Exchange Files, and ACO, which is the newer type. And it's that type that's the problem. Affinity can't read them directly. But they can all be converted and imported into Affinity Publisher for you to use. Don't forget the Mac color picker, which is incredibly powerful. That's the device that lets you use all of the color swatches you've created in Affinity Publisher, maybe in a Word document or a Pages document or even Keynote. It makes swatches and palettes that you've created in Publisher and have made system palettes available across the system. The application that I use to do the conversion is called Color Palette Converter, even though I've put a U in and it doesn't have a U in because they're American. <laughs> so if you're looking for it, take the U out. Um, it was $1.99. Maybe Mike could confirm that for me. Color Palette Converter, no U. What's the price at the moment? Then there's Adobe Capture which is the iOS application that I demonstrated, which enables you to take photographs and make palettes from them. I've actually done that um, at events and things where it has had branding around and I've taken a general photo and then I've manually moved the little bouncing balls over the branding and it's created me a branding palette from there. It's now $4.99, but it's, it's worth it. Because not only can you convert palettes with it, but you can also um, edit the palettes and give names to colours and then export them. So it's just a nicer interface to work with. We also had a very brief look at Adobe Colour, which used to be called Cooler. K-U-L-E-R. You may have heard that. They renamed it Adobe Colour, which I thought was sad because I thought Cooler was cool. I actually did a session, didn't I? Cooler, cooler colour with Adobe Cooler. <laughs> I like that one. Uh, people seem to like that session. So there may be something we could take a longer one. Uh, and we looked at Colour Lovers, which is colourlovers.com. 
lots and lots of palettes up there for you to have a look at. Do check the licensing out if you're about to try using them, though. And the last thing that Mike's also now he's appeared going to find the link for is Snappy App. And Snappy App is completely free. Again, it's a Mac app, I'm afraid. I don't know of an equivalent on Windows. But Snappy App le lets you take screenshots and then have them hovering over everything else. Um, so for colours and picking colours, it's perfect. I also use it when I'm in an application, something like ScreenFlow. It has a panel that flies up and this fly up panel shows you markers. And the second you click away, it disappears. And I need I need it there so I can type out the markers. So I take a screenshot of it with Snappy and it hovers over everything else. It's really amazing and it's completely free. Didn't used to be free, but it is free now. OK, if you have enjoyed that and you've found that useful in any kind of way, please, can you give me a thumbs up? YouTube likes it if that happens. I like it if that happens. That would be much appreciated. In the meanwhile, why did I not update this slide? Google Plus, long time ago. Um, thank you for being with us. We always have a ball in these sessions. I've been keeping my eye on the chat. I think I've dealt with questions as we've gone through. But if you have any questions or anything that comes to you later, if you're with me now, put it in the chat. I will stay around and answer some questions. If not, contact me like don't, don't bother with the Google thing, though. Don't do that because that's not there anymore. <laughs> But you can contact me uh, any of the other ways um, and I will be happy to answer your questions. So I'll leave that on there at the moment. Has anybody got any questions? Oh, thank you, Paul. Paul says, new to publisher. That was the best tutorial I've seen so far. Excellent. Glad you enjoyed it. It's a little bit niche because it's only dealing with one thing, which is the colour side of it. But having the colour side correct will free you up for all of the other stuff. There's also two other. Uh, I've actually put a playlist together. I've got three videos on YouTube dedicated to publisher. Can you just find the playlist, Mike? Uh, it'll be on my site somewhere. Did it last night. Um, I did a full session uh, about two days after the beta was first released. So it was crashing, as I recall. <laughs> it was great fun. I think that session was about an hour and a half. But when the final release was released about eight months later, I did another full session, which from memory, I think, was almost three hours. What can I say? We just got carried away. We did everything. We did everything in Publisher for hours. <laughs> But you could watch it in episodes. Um, but I've had good feedback on both of them that people find them useful. So feel free to take a look at those. And um, if you do need any help, you know where I am. Thank you, Stephen. That's incredibly kind of you. Clarity with a gentle touch. Yeah, we were four minutes late starting, Mike, because YouTube was having a moment, as everything else today was having a moment. Ended up on... Hmm? I ended up um, back on the, the backup server. So we're, we're broadcasting, but we're on the backup server. It was just that kind of day. I did say that at the beginning, didn't I? Because we did another show before this show. Um, we do marooned at MacBytes headquarters at the moment because we're marooned at MacBytes headquarters. Um, and I said I'd had the technical day. Oh, it was bad. You'll be glad to know, folks, my keyboard. This was one of my problems last night. Um, my keyboard managed to keep the D key going. <laughs> Way. I'd had problems all day. It's not my keyboard. Mike kindly lent me his uh, rather long in the tooth, but incredibly useful USB keyboard. And the D key wasn't working on that either. So I'm thinking it's an Apple issue. So at the end of the show, I'm going to reboot. There were times I used to wear a badge of honour of how long between reboots, wasn't there, Mike? And sometimes with, with, with Apple, you used to be able to go four and five months without a reboot. And now it's like every other week. And it's a little bit like um, Geek Roulette. I'll reboot and the D key will come back and something else will break. So I'm going to have to um, be very brave and do it today because tomorrow I've got another session. Uh, we're going uh, with... Uh, not marooned. Well, we have we are marooned. We're marooned at seven o'clock tomorrow night on MacBytes FM. But we also have uh, MacBytes After Hours, and I can't have any snafus in MacBytes After Hours. So think of me and send me positive vibes as I reboot my machine. It'll not be good. You're going to rewatch. Oh. <laughs> You just bought it for your Windows machine at work. I do have the Windows machine, uh, the Windows version, and I'm thinking I should probably do a dedicated video on the Windows one because 
you know, some of the Mac stuff isn't there. It is a shame, though. I really wish they could replicate that somehow, but they need Microsoft to do it. And that doesn't like, look like it's happening anytime soon. Um, Rewatch it later for, for the for the tricky bits. <laughs> there you go. I do have a video I'm thinking of redoing on YouTube. It's all about the OS 10 color picker, uh, Mac OS color picker now. It's still valid. The only reason that I'm thinking of redoing it is I think I did it on Mavericks. And they changed the, they're now pencils, but they call them crayons. Back then they were crayons and they looked like crayons and they were flat crayons. So that one part of the interface has changed. The rest of the information is bang on accurate. Could you find the link for that as well, Mike? The OS 10 colour picker. Um, that one will give you an idea of just how powerful the Mac OS colour picker is in its own right. So in a way, it's a really good thing that they've hooked into it. Many moons ago, I had to do a video on Pixelmator. On, that's right. Um, Pixelmator had their own colour picker and then they changed things. And that was how come I ended up doing this whole thing on it because people were saying like, but, but it's useless and it's not. The colour picker is amazingly powerful, but it's one of these things that everything's hidden. You know Apple, but it can do amazing, amazing things. Good catch, Jonathan. Yes, the Affinity apps are amazing and they're all 50% off at the moment. So um, you could get three for the price of one and a half. Um, I actually finished off my collection while they were on offer. I already had Affinity Designer and Affinity Photo, both for Mac and Windows. Um, I'd bought Publisher twice. I'd bought that in the Mac App Store and I bought it direct from them because I was on the beta program and I got early access if I bought it. But then I wanted it from the Mac App Store as well because it's activated. It's a long story. But the one that I was missing was Publisher for Windows. So I went and bought Publisher for Windows while I was at it. So I now have the full set. I've got I've, I've got um, I've got nine of them. <laughs> I've got them. I've got the Windows version of all three and then I've got the Mac version of all three twice. Um, some people want to know why I do that. I do that because the applications are activated and you are only allowed a certain number of activations. You are not going to get it activated at all if the activation server is down, which has happened to me with other applications. So if I also buy it in the App Store, in a, in a squeeze, I can get it installed from the App Store and then install the other one properly later. But there you go. So Tracy's also bought it from the Mac App Store and have bought Designer Direct this month. Way Exactly. That was what I felt. They were very fast in coming out and um, giving you a 50 percent discount. They've also put all of their videos on as well. There's 50 percent off the books. So like you, I thought, you know, I've been using Affinity Designer since it came out which I think was 2015, but it was in beta for a long time before that. And they've never charged you for an upgrade. Um, the day will come and I will gleefully give them money. They have brought out, when, when you look at it now and you look at it back then, there's no comparison. So they've given you a lot already for free with incremental upgrades. There's things that I like to be in Affinity Designer. <laughs> I love Affinity Designer. I am in Affinity Designer the most. Uh, that's my most used application. After that would be Publisher and then after that would be Photo. M mainly because I don't really edit that many photos now. There's nothing wrong with it at all. It's where I'd be if I was editing photos. What I do use it for, and it's amazing for that, I batch process with Affinity Photo. If you want to see a video on that, let me know. Does Mike use it for his work Windows machine? I do believe Mike's in the house now, um, but I'll need to turn him on if you want to hear him, it, figuratively speaking. Uh, let me swiftly come out of there and get his audio alive so you can hear him. Uh, now, which one's you, Mike? Speak. Hello. Ah, he's that one there. Right, let's make him alive. Now they can hear you. So Neil wants to know, do you use it for your work Windows machine? I don't. I've got it on my surface and I've probably opened it once or twice. <laughs> as with anything designery, creatively. Um, but no, it's not something we use at work. But you do have Adobe stuff and considering the price of it, it's, it's really silly that they don't. Yeah. Um, I think it's just a fact that not many people train it and they can get training on um, Adobe products. The other issue for you is, I mean, you do have it if you needed it. The thing is, you just don't need it that much. No. But if I'd done you a design and you wanted to change the date on it, 
you do have the applications. Yeah, as I said, they're on my surface. So carry my surface into work. We did that, didn't we? We did that with one of the brochures. We did. Yeah. I'd done a brochure and I think I'd got the wrong year on it. Not surprisingly. <laughs> it was probably another tech night. <laughs> Disaster. But Mike was actually able to open it and edit it and then resave it. So, yes, he has them, but he doesn't use it much. You'd like batch processing. Mike, I need a post-it note. Tracy, you have seen the post-it notes. I'm going for I'm, I'm going for the yellow one at the top. And I can certainly do that. The other session that I had listed. Good night, Kim. Um, that people were interested in was. The export persona in designer. So let me put that down. Batch processing. Batch processing is very cool. I love um, how Kim says night. It's four <laughs> o'clock in the afternoon over there. <laughs> yes, but it's night here. It's very dark. Oh, it's here. two o'clock in the afternoon. Can I actually say not only is it night, it's still too warm. It is. It's still far too warm. It is. Right. Uh, batch processing in Affinity Photo. Um, I put, that particularly came into its own when I transfer photos from my phone and they are high efficiency image captures. It's very, very annoying. Uh, right, what's going on here? I think, have I missed something? Do I need to scroll up there in the chat? Uh, it is a UK company. Yes, they are based in Nottingham. They've been in Nottingham oh, uh, a long, long time. They were in Nottingham uh, the early 90s when I was using it on Windows. All right, let me catch up with this. Uh, your demos are captivating. You stayed the whole time. Thank you, Curtis. I, I'm, I hope you enjoyed that. Uh, hopefully you learned something too. I did get the link, Peter. Not quite had chance to have a look at it. Um, it's been a, a chaotic day. If you're on Marooned, you would know. Oh, it's been bad. Um, literally everything that could go wrong did go wrong with big brass knobs on. So um, I, need, I need to seriously sit down and watch that, but I will do. Um, I love the idea of how you described it. So I need to think about that. You are very welcome. Good night. Good night, Alex. Hope you enjoyed it too. Um, so I've got down one session that you would like, which is batch processing. And the other one that I'd got was the export persona. Yeah, maybe some people don't even know about the export persona. I could not live without the export persona. You love Nottingham. Oh, wow. Um... Oh, uh, so Snappy App is saying it currently uh, works on Mac OS and iOS and they're working to expand it. Oh, now that is good news. It's a very good app. It's, it's a quirky app in terms of you look at it and you think I'm not sure I'd have the need for that or I've got something else that does screen captures. But its unique selling point is the capture it takes sits over the top of everything else which means you can refer to it. So I take screenshots of dialogue boxes when I'm putting together training materials. And that way I don't have to constantly flip flop from application to application and back again just to see the dialogue box. So for that, it's absolutely perfect. Um, other than that, it does have a library. It does let you annotate. It's actually very fully functional in terms of being a screen capture application. But the one feature it has is the one that I bought it for which is they float over the top. What's the other one I used to use for that, Mike? The one, the, the name constantly escapes me. There are two apps that, are, that I know that do that. Um, that's that's the only Something one. Something float. Wasn't it? Screen float, Something that's float. the one. Um, screen float, I thought was better. And then I realised as I started working with it, I think it was when I got a Retina Mac and I needed to make them bigger. Snappy app has got this whole shortcut thing going on so you don't really need to touch the mouse the other reason is that snappy app has an ios app and it synchronizes all of the screen captures you've taken on your desktop and or your mac uh, your phone and synchronizes them together in icloud so i can look at things i've taken on my desktop if i've gone away on my laptop and i'm away for like three four days we went away in february i'd be on a different computer and i wouldn't have those screen caps but because it synchronizes because it's got this server side thing going on with iCloud. I can open up the app on my phone or my iPad or my other computer, my MacBook Air, and there it is. And I could just carry on as normal. So it's a very good app. It used to be paid for. I think it used to be somewhere between $4.99 and $7.99. And I think the reason they took it to free was that they hadn't updated it in a while. 
Um, but it is a very, very good app. I would certainly pay for it. So you're going to tell me why you love N Nottingham, Neil. Is, is Neil somewhere? Is Nottingham somewhere you've been and enjoyed? I have been to Nottingham a couple of times. Um, my my dad's brother uh, and all his family lived there. So we went over to Nottingham for a wedding, when, when, but I was very young. And then I had to go to Nottingham for a continuing professional education class that I needed to do for when I was a lawyer. And it was in accounts. It was horrible. <gasps> it was a, a naughty, nasty session. But I do remember... Um, I, th I said, I don't fancy going on my own. We we're only going for the day. I took my mum with me and uh, she went around shopping all day. By the time she came back, I, I do not like shopping, as many of you know. By the time she came back, she came back with, with bags full of clothes. And I said, oh, we've had a good day then. She said, they're not for me, they're for you. <laughs> She'd gone shopping and the stuff she bought was for me. And I'm saying, mum, you're supposed to go for you. And the other time I went to Nottingham, you'll remember this, Mike, I wasn't pleased. Something's ringing. Why is something ringing? I don't know. Um, I don't think it's my phone. That's ringing. <laughs> Why oh. is it ringing? Nobody's got the number. Who is it? it? Well, it doesn't say it's ringing. It's just making a... Oh. It's vibrating. Is it one of those random Skype calls I had? I've no idea. Like at half past Go one. Go away. In, half Go past away. one in the morning. It's ringing again. How do you turn it off? <laughs> The thing is, my phone, my, it's not my primary phone, it's my secondary phone. And it's definitely ringing, but there's nothing on the screen. So I can't even reject the call. Oh. I'll just sling it in a drawer, it'll be fine. <laughs> not even joking, right in the middle of it. Uh, my Skype call from earlier, oh, Paul, it's finally caught up with me. <laughs> How many hours ago is that? <laughs> Do you know, it won't stop ringing. I don't think it actually is. Right, right. I've closed the drawer now, so now I don't care. Yes, the other time I went to Nottingham, I had always wanted to go to uh, the city ground, Nottingham, for a match. I wanted to see um, United play Forest. And I'd always wanted to go because my mum was a huge Nottingham Forest fan. Well, actually, she was a huge Brian Clough fan, uh, which meant a huge Nottingham Forest fan. And I went in 1984 with my dad. We'd got best seats in the house. It was fabulous. And we got there... And there was a bit of rain, but, you know, it wasn't that bad. Trust me, it wasn't that bad. It was in the days when you could look through a gateway and see the pitch and the pitch looked fine. The next minute, um, a Rolls Royce careered past me at an alarming rate with Brian Clough driving and the what was back then, the referee and linesman in the back. He was escorting them away from the ground because they declared the pitch wasn't playable. I'd seen the pitch. There was nothing wrong with the pitch. Um, it was because there was a lot of collieries in Nottingham. 1984, minor strike. They, had, they did not have enough police to police the game. So they called it off and uh, he had to be escorted away. <laughs> yeah, so uh, I didn't get to see them then. But I did get to, to see my one and only match at the city ground Nottingham in 1991. And Mike had the opportunity to be there with me before we were dating and he didn't turn up. <laughs> you silly boy. You could have gone to that match if you'd have taken a day's holiday. Mm. <laughs> he didn't take a day's holiday, so he didn't get to go. And he, he didn't get to go on the, the coach with me. Yeah, call most haunted. Yeah, that's scary. The thing is with this phone, this phone is my secondary phone. It's my old iPhone 7. And um, that is very strange. What's it saying now? This isn't right. That isn't right. Let's have a look. No, that was ringing. You saw it ringing. It there's there's ringing. no call. So it is. It's possessed. There is uh, something on the Skypey thing. Is it a Skypey thing? No, nope, not Skypey thing either. Hmm. You're right. It's just possessed. So it's my secondary phone. It's got in it an O2 SIM. Um, with a number that I don't know. So I've never given this number to anybody. So if somebody's ringing me, which never rung before, I know I sound um, strange with phones, but I'm not good with phones, am I? No. Um, you know, so it, it rings me. And I, I, the other day, somebody rang to wish me a happy birthday. And I'm sitting here thinking, why is my watch vibrating? Because my phone was on silent. And I'd also put it on the table out of the way. You know, that thing of putting your phone away so you're not disturbed, that. Um, and I thought, why is my watch buzzing? And, and by the time it finished buzzing, I realised somebody had rung me. And I literally look at the phone as though, oh, 
it makes phone calls as well. That's me with a phone. But that one, no, that's possessed. That is definitely possessed. Nobody has that number. There's no, there is not a call on the phone. There's no call in Skype. It doesn't say you've missed a call. Nothing. Yeah, OK, so I'll put it back in the drawer and we'll just leave it. I'm not I'm not the best with with talkie tech. What can I say? <laughs> so has anybody got any other questions? I've got two sessions that you would like to see. So I've written those down. Um, let me know if you've got any questions. Other than that, I, I'm going to head off and reboot this machine. Scariness, scariness. It may or may not ever come back. If it does, I'll see you tomorrow in uh, After Hours which Mike and I are about to discuss now because Neil's in and you know you know the three little letters he's thinking of V B A yes the show is brought to you by the letters V B and A uh, that's what he's thinking about for tomorrow so Paul says I'm the same way with work phones I tell people I'm much better with computers <laughs> I just, phones just, I, I just don't know. I've never been good with phones. I think it's because I, I, I get in the zone and I really do get in the zone. And um, the story I, that I, I told Mike, uh, many moons ago, I was working on my Amiga. So we're looking at the late 80s, my Commodore Amiga. And I was listening to some football at one point, about three o'clock Saturday afternoon. My mum and dad were away on holiday. So the house was completely peaceful. And um, I got, deep into this problem and it was all to do with a set of three and a half inch floppy disks and I needed to make copies but what I was finding was I was making a copy and then when I changed one I put the copy back in and, and oh weirdness was happening and I, I just I kept doing it and doing it and I tried three more disks and three more disks three more disks and I suddenly glanced around so that was probably about three o'clock in the afternoon I glanced around and I, and I looked out the window and I thought boy it's dark so I looked at the clock and it said like half past four, quarter to five. And I thought, yeah, I know, I know that it's getting a bit dark now, but whoa, that's dark. And then I realised it was half past four in the morning. So I'd been at it for 12, over 12 hours and not noticed. <laughs> that's me. So, yeah, if you ring me, you, you, you disturb my, my, my zone and, and then I can't get back in my zone. So, no, 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 no. Send me an email and I'll get round to it when I can. <laughs> I'm also actually, um, P Peter needs to know this. So good night, Peter. You need to know I'm shocking with Facebook. It's actually amazing. I've managed to get your messages because I'm really not good with Facebook, but I will catch up with that tomorrow. Right. OK, then I am seeing no more questions, but hopefully I will see a lot of you tomorrow, either in Marooned at MacBytes headquarters, MacBytes FM, seven o'clock UK time or MacBytes after hours, nine o'clock UK time on YouTube. Other than that, I will say good night to you all. So it's good night from me. It's good night from me. Yes, Mike joined me later. I didn't know if I was allowed to say. Oh, you are. You are. Okay. And we'll both see you next time. Good night. Thank you for being with me. <laughs>